passage you've given me today is uh, Luke chapter 15. And uh, let's have a look. Who's that? Very good. It's a good start. I came across a, um, a book uh, a little while ago called The Hidden Meanings of Nursery Rhymes. And there are quite some interesting things and some quite disconcerting things about nursery rhymes. And this guy was making a, the case for who or what was Humpty Dumpty. Um, and he was saying that Humpty Dumpty, if you, it's mentioned by Lewis Carroll, I'll come to that in a minute, was not an egg, but was actually a cannon in a tower in Colchester in the Civil War, which was uh, at that time a royalist stronghold. And it says that the tower was actually knocked down by a barrage of other cannons, and the big cannon, Humpty Dumpty, was knocked off its perch off, off the tower and was broken. And he says that is the only way of making sense of this rhyme. And he came across, he says, another version of Humpty Dumpty, which says this. In 1648, when England suffers pains of state, the roundheads laid siege to Colchester town, where the king's men fought for the crown. There one-eyed Thompson stood on the wall, a gunner with the deadliest aim of all. From St. Mary's Tower, the cannon he fired, Humpty Dumpty was his name, and then you know the rest. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, had a great fall, which when he got knocked down, all the king's horses, which the royalists and all the king's men, couldn't put it together again. And that actually makes a bit of sense rather than anything else. And it's an egg, because if you've read uh, Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, he doesn't actually say he's an egg, he hints at it. And if you can make sense of some of Lewis Carroll's stuff, then you're probably on the same drugs as he was. <laughs> what on earth has that got to do with Luke chapter 15? Because my point being is this. Sometimes there's something that we think we know well, and like Humpty Dumpty, the prodigal son is so well known. It's one of the few Bible stories that people really know well and they understand there's a nice message about it. But it isn't exactly what we think. You come across things like this. This is from the Daily Record, which is a newspaper in Scotland, a wide circulation. In pictures, it says the prodigal son, Scottish footballers have returned to their old clubs. Um, and this is a picture of uh, Wayne Rooney. Um, I no, don't understand this article. I've read it a few times. An unlikely prodigal son to both Manchester United and Chelsea. I can understand Everton, but they were trying to make a point that Rooney was a prodigal son. If you look at the dictionary, the definition of the word prodigal means this. Spending money or using resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant, which might be true of many premiership footballers. But it is in that actually, and is true of a bit of what the passage talks about. But really... We need to use it for somebody who has come back, somebody who's come back from where they were and come back home for all the right reasons. And the parable of the prodigal son, if you look in your Bible, it doesn't actually say he was a prodigal son. It's the title that has been given to it, and we talk about it as that. I'm going to suggest to you that it works at least three levels, and it could be the father's great loving heart, or more concerningly, the Pharisees are alive and well and living in Nottingham. Let's have a look. Who's this? Thank goodness for that. It is an educated congregation. James Anderson, who is a cricketer. He's England's leading wicket taker, crept over 400 wickets in the last test. And if you look very carefully at this picture, you'll see the way he holds the ball. And Jimmy Anderson's great ability is to swing the ball both ways with the same action. He can bowl an outswinger and an inswinger, and the same thing happens. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is a picture. The um, red one is an outswinger, and the batsman would probably have two of these, leave it alone, and then when the next one comes, would think about that being left alone, and it would either bowl him or get him LBW. You never quite know what is going to happen. Again, what are you saying? What am I talking to you about? Well, who was Jesus aiming at? And I suggest that he was giving two simple parables, and then the real parable that was going to do the business to make his point. Let's get back to the, to the passage. So the wickets that Jesus was aiming at when he told this parable are these. Tax collectors and sinners, it's a great combination, often go together. We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then it goes on to say, so Jesus told them this parable. And in fact, there are three parables. For time, we didn't read the first two. But basically, as a man loses a sheep, he goes looking for it, he finds it, and there's a celebration. Fair enough. 
The religious leaders would have liked that. There's lots of illustrations about God being a shepherd and us being a sheep, which is actually a good example of God's sense of humor. Sammy Gibson, who you may know, uh, came across or rather or even wrote a little chorus that says, I am a sheep, ba ba. I am stupid in the head. And when we, had, we sing happily, we are his sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. Just have a think about it, what you're saying. But it is true, isn't it? Um, and there's many illustrations in the Old Testament of uh, God's people being sheep and God being a shepherd. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees, would have said, yeah, we understand that. The second ball is the second parable is a woman who loses a, who's lost a coin. She looks for it, she finds it, and she celebrates. Fine. Lost, found, celebrate, we get the pattern. And then the third one comes. There's a lost son who returns, and there's a celebration. But this ball is going a completely different way, and it's got a much more important point, because there are bits of it that are quite unexpected. Now, I would suggest to you in this passage, there are several SIB moments, which is not Thunderbirds, it's not Captain Scarlet. And what I mean is sharp intakes of breath. And when the audience would have heard this parable in a way that we probably don't, there's so many things they would have gone, fancy saying that. You know, the sharp intake of breath. Let's have a look at the first one. So, number one is when Jesus says this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And what was the son actually saying here? It wasn't, Dad, I've got a business venture. I want to buy a flat. Do you think you could possibly get to do some equity release and give me a bit of an advance? Do you think you could help me out and just give me a little bit of cash? The son was actually saying in that culture, and quite unambiguously, Dad, as far as you and me are concerned, I think you're dead, and I want my money now. I don't want any further relationship with you. Just give me the money. I'm out. You and I, no more. And that is at the end when the father says, the son of mine who was dead and is alive and is lost and is found, was actually literally true because that's what the son have said. It was the biggest insult that anyone could say to a father in that time. So the man divided his property between them. And the implication is that they got half and half. Now that would have been a surprise to the people at that time because the elder son would have had the biggest uh, property and this, the father went above and beyond he, t- he could have said, you cheeky boy, out. He didn't. He gave him what he asked for and let him waste it. Um, the third short, sharp intake of breath is, after he'd spent everything, it was a, f- a severe famine, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with all the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, to a Jew, this was the worst job you could have, feeding and dealing with unclean, ceremonially, let alone by habit, pigs. I don't know what your idea of the worst job is. My father-in-law, Peter Leslie, um, tells me quite a few times about how when he was growing up, not just in the last millennium, but, but it was, about they only had one tap of running water, and that was cold, and the toilet was at the back end of the garden, had no running water. So you can work out, out the rest. On, I think, a fortnightly basis, somebody used to come along and empty it. And that was the muck cart. And that, I think, is the worst job you could ever have. And aren't we glad for running water and flushing things like this? It makes our life so much easier. And this is the equivalent of a Jew of this. This guy was at the absolute bottom. There was nothing, he, nothing worse that they could possibly think of. And he was hungry, he was smelly, and he was dirty. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's sons have hired servants, rather, of food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He got up, went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion, ran to his son, threw his arms round him, and kissed him. And this, again, is another sharp intake of breath. Because the picture shows quite nicely, that, the, and the text says, that the father ran to the son. If you were a mature man of significant status, as this guy was, he had a big estate, he had servants, he had fields, as the passage makes clear, you would not expect a man of this maturity to run. It was undignified. You just didn't do it. As an example, 
I tried to find a picture of the Queen running. <laughs> you get the point? There isn't one, because she doesn't. It's not what monarchs do, because it's below their dignity. This father, he ran to his son, and despite the odor of bacon, he threw his arms round him and kissed him. Again, this would have been, a, he did what? Yes, he did. And the son goes into his spiel and says, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. And the father does three things. He puts the best robe on him. He puts a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Taking him backwards, the, the son said, I want to be a servant. The father said, no, I'm going to give you shoes. Shoes are what the, the people in the house wear. The servants were probably barefoot. He got sandals. Put a ring on his finger. This was the authority. Maybe even a signet ring to mark out who you were. Put the best robe. This gives you some status. You're not in your rags anymore. Also, by the way, you need to get that filthy stuff off and get something good. So they began to celebrate. So what does this actually mean for us? What is the point of this st study? What's the point of this parable that the Lord Jesus told? It's actually the longest parable. And there are points for us, if we are considering outreach, if we're considering evangelism, there are points from this passage that we need to hear and take on board. The first is, there's actually no sin that God cannot forgive. If you want to be a clever theologian, talk to me about the Holy Spirit, see me afterwards over coffee and I'll, I'll, I'll put you right. If you want to be forgiven, you can. If you want to be forgiven, there is no sin that God cannot forgive. No matter how you've insulted people, no matter what you've done, no matter what the son said to the father, he was prepared to forgive him. Secondly, that sin is primarily against God as well as against people. No matter what we've done to somebody, the actual law that we've broken is ultimately God's moral law, God's holiness, God's standard for the universe. Thirdly, and very importantly, God is watching and waiting for you to come back. And God works on a grace principle. What does grace mean? Go back to Wayne Rooney for a minute. Wayne Rooney was given the position of being a premiership footballer because he was seen and noted for his talents. Everton picked him up when he was quite young, nurtured him along, and it was quite clear this guy had some significant talent. We're the exact opposite. God looks at us from a very early age in fact, from even before we were born, knows exactly what we were like, and he still loves us and wants us in spite of us. And that is called grace, giving us something which we do not deserve. There's an old hymn that I like that says this, Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin, how shall my tongue describe it? Where should its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. And it can and it does. The chorus talks about wonderful grace, all sufficient for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression. Now, you don't know me. There's a few that know me fairly well. I don't know many of you. But only God knows what the scope of my transgression is. Transgression is crossing the line, and you know deep down within you what you are capable of. And that hymn nicely says that God's grace is broader than the scope of our transgression. Greater far than all my sin and shame, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power. And that reminds us that the preaching of the Christian gospel is not about a change of venue, it's not about a different way of living, although of course it is. It's about true transformation, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Has that grace reached you? Has it empowered you? Have you felt it? It says that the son came to his senses and he went back and confessed. And that is a picture of what the preaching of the gospel coming to Christ means one to realize where and what you are two to go back and three to confess that you've done wrong and are then received for forgiveness turning around is repentance repentance is not just saying sorry 
Repentance is saying sorry and then turning around in a completely different direction. I lived in London for a while and I was um, driving along one night and I thought, there's a bus coming towards me. On that bus, it's got where I want to go. Now, one of us is going the wrong way. Either the bus isn't going to where it says on the front or I'm lost. Now, I took what was a sensible decision and thought that the London bus driver knows the roads better than I do, and I turned round and followed the bus and surprisingly got to where I wanted to be. But there was no point in my saying I've looked at the map. This was a little while ago. We didn't have sat in those days. Even my car was black and white. That's true. Um, and to say, look, I'm going the wrong way. I need to admit it and turn around. And that's what repentance means. That's what we have to do, and God does the rest. Three things. The Father forgave him, he welcomed him, and there was joy. And just to remind ourselves that God loves people much more. In fact, God loves people full stop. We tend to think about people, money, and things. What would I have said if my son had done something like that? I would love to say to you, oh, I would have done exactly the same. I have an idea that I would have said, it's good to see you. For start off, get yourself washed. I'm not coming, you stink. And we'll talk in the morning. You're quite right. You hurt me badly. And there's so many things about us, aren't there? You hurt me badly. Work here for a couple of months and maybe we'll have a talk about it and we'll see what, what we can do. I'd like to suggest to you that the early church understood God's grace very, very quickly, and that's why it grew so, so fast and would, could understand opposition so well. Let's have a look at Paul. You know Paul um, wrote most of the um, New Testament letters. He started off being Saul, met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, which is another phrase that we use from the Bible, and had his life completely turned around. The first time we see Paul in the New Testament, when he's standing holding the coats of the people who were throwing stones to kill Stephen, one of the early Christians. And then it goes on to say that Paul wrought havoc amongst the church. When he was on his way to Damascus, he had letters to arrest people. And there's not much said, but if you dip into Acts, in Acts 26, Paul is giving his testimony. And he says, on the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, which is a bit you don't hear about, but Paul clearly knew. I cast my vote against them, which suggests that he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin at that time, and he was very happy to vote for these people to be killed because they were Christians. And the thing that comes out from that is that Paul must have had fellowship with people whose relatives he had killed and been complicit and active in their deaths. But Paul knew and felt for forgiveness. I did a quick search this morning, I've just checked up, but in the NIV, even if you exclude Hebrews, Paul mentions grace 78 times in his letters. And true as John Newton could say that grace is amazing. It saved a wretch like me. And Paul knew full well how much he had been forgiven. And Paul was probably eating with people whose relative he had helped kill. And the question is, is that how much we can forgive people? Is that how much we feel for those who are not Christians? Is that how much we want them to be forgiven? And that would be in a big, short, sharp intake of breath. Remember when Ananias, is, the Lord says, look, there's a, there's a guy here in Straight Street, you go and preach, go and get him, he's praying. And I said, whoa, you can't almost hear it. Say, it's Paul. Look, look, God, I'm, it's Paul. You're not going to, Saul, you're not going to tell me. And he did. And then when he brought him back to Jerusalem, they weren't happy initially, but they understood and they appreciate what grace meant in practice. And God's grace, God wants to accept us, because after all, even we cause the death of his son. There's another old hymn that says, how deep the father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch, i.e. me, you, his treasure. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it's finished. Because that is what we would have done. 
Have you ever thought where, where you would have been that Good Friday? The disciples had run away. There was a baying mob saying, crucify him. wonder where you would have been. Where would I have been? It's a thought, isn't it? So if we're thinking about evangelism, we have to get the fundamentals right, that God's love and grace extends to all. God can and will forgive. There's no point trotting out God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, unless we actually realize what the whosoever means. If you've been in a good Sunday school, you know that whosoever means you, me, and everybody else. God welcomes, and there is joy over finding the lost. Not that we've made a convert, but that the sheep, the lost sheep, and more importantly, the lost son has come home. And if we stand on our dignity, we will never ever get there. As a teenager, we used to have a Whitson treat. And one Whitson treat, I remember that there were two leaders of the church who got themselves in what was effectively stocks. And for a small fee, you could throw wet sponges at them. No, I remember that. I thought it was great. One of them was my father, which enjoyed it even more. But there was another guy in the children's meeting. These were elders of our church. And I thought, later on, I realized that was something they were prepared to do to give the young people a good time so they would enjoy. And also, it said something. And if we're going to stand on our dignity, we're never really going to get anywhere. As Paul says, he was prepared to become all things to all men so that he might save some. And there's a story I came across about uh, um, Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway. He was a great author in around the mid-20th century. He was quite a character, did some very interesting things. Not all of them we would condone. I didn't realize that his grandfather was a a graduate of American Bible College, and he was brought up in quite a strict home. And he comments that there was no love shown to him, and he hated Christian things. And Hemingway writes a short story about a Spanish chap called Pablo, who a long time ago had become estranged from his father due to things he'd done. And quite correctly, the father, in the legal moral terms, had thrown him out. The father is unwell, and he puts an advert in a local newspaper that says, Pablo, all is forgiven. Meet me next Tuesday in front of such and such a hotel in the Times Square, in the town square. Not Times Square, it's in New York. So next Tuesday, 5 to 12, the father goes into that square and he finds not one man waiting for him, but 800. Because Pablo's a very common name and there's a load of people who wanted to come back. And all they were waiting for was an invitation. It's our job to give that invitation and to welcome them back. Finally, my last couple of minutes... Who was not happy when the prodigal son came back? I did a beach mission when I was quite a bit younger, and it was one of the set questions. It would always get a good laugh. Who was not happy when the prodigal son came back? And, of course, the answer is the fatted calf. (laughs) But fairly seriously, moving on to who was not happy, remember where we started. We started off with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law mumbling about the sinners who was eating with Jesus. Then Jesus told them. The point of the parable was at the people who were mumbling about what Jesus was saying. The eldest son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied. Your father's killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father this, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him. And just look what's going on here. Look at the words. I've been slaving away. I've been working, following the rules. I've been doing what I've been told. Is there enjoyment there? I've been trying to do everything right, and I haven't enjoyed it. I haven't got anything out of it. It's me, 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 but I've missed something. And by the way, this son of yours, where the father says, this brother of yours, notice the difference? My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. And he didn't realize it. 
that he was working for something that actually he already had. He'd got his share, it was actually his anyway, and here he was working for something that was already had. And in fact, that's so often a trap that we can fall into with salvation. We think we need to earn it, we need to carry on following this, doing that, the other, ticking our boxes, making sure we've got all our credits in the right place so we can have it given to us. The Bible reminds us that Abraham and others uh, have righteousness given, credited by faith. We cannot earn it. Despite of what we are, God gives it to us. That is the point of grace. As I finish then, the elder brother was outside. Not only was he outside physically, he was outside relationally to his own brother and clearly with his father and spiritually he was nowhere. And that is exactly what the Pharisees were like. These were the religious people of their time who they knew everything but didn't feel it, didn't understand it, and more to the point, got no benefit from it, and were putting people off. And ultimately, they were the ones who instigated putting the son of with the chief priest, putting the son of God on the cross. And it is an easy trap to fall into of making sure we have our rules right, but completely missing our relationship and our spiritual relationship with, with God. Come across a quote, they were drenched in religion, but outside God's grace. And 2,000 years later, it is so easy for us to fall into that trap. So I said that this parable works on three levels, and there are three people in it, and we are one, or maybe all of them. Are we like the son? Have we never, ever really felt the father's love? Have we never, ever come home? The parable says, come to your senses, repent, turn around, come back, and the Father will recognize you. As Christians, we're to demonstrate the Father's love, because after all, God has given us so much of his love that we are to reflect that. And if we are to in encourage and welcome people into the church, it has to be that love that comes out. Or are we like the elder brother, working away, so busy, and yet, actually, the distance between us and our Heavenly Father is huge. And in fact, all we're doing is putting people off. And when the smelly people from the pigsty come in, we say, they're yours, not mine. And if we have such a great salvation that God has given us, we have to be prepared to recognize that and make sure it's not us that are putting people off. So who are we or where are we? Are we inside with the Father? Or are we outside complaining? Or are we in the pig yard? Again, we're in one of those. So I hope that we've, like Humpty Dumpty, looked at something in a slightly different way and understood that there is something in us for us. A passage which we know well can give us real insight into what we're like, what God's like, and more to the point, to avoid what other people can be like because it can be a great ba a barrier and putting people off to people coming in and feeling that Father's love. The Father has got his arms wide open. Jesus had his arms wide open on the cross when he was nailed there to make it possible for us to come back. He is waiting. I wonder today, have you ever come back? Have you ever realized you're miles away you're in with the pigs, and you need to come and feel that love from God. If we're trying to show God's love, we need to. And let's make sure we're not like the Pharisees and putting people off.